Hi folks, in this video I'm going to be walking through the creation of a bathroom render with SketchUp, Podium Browser, and either SU Podium or Pro Walker GPU. So I'm going to be going through how the SketchUp scene was constructed, um, which Podium Browser components and materials were used, and then I'll just briefly explain how it was lit and rendered. Okay, so the goal of this project was to recreate this bathroom image by Atwood Custom Homes, which is seen here on the Metri website. And the reason this, this image was chosen is because we recently uploaded a large set of finishing profiles in a Podium browser, and they're all manufactured by that company Metri, who makes baseboards, crown molding, casings. Um, and so this image uses their very square finishing collection. So I wanted to do a demo scene using these new components. And as you can see, we have that very square set of molding profiles. Um, and so I thought it would be a, a nice little project to work through on YouTube. So once again, here's the reference image seen full screen. And this was the rendered result that we arrived at. And I think it's a pretty close match. You know, the scale is off in some places. I think my vanity section was modeled a little bit too long. And I, I did use a slightly different aspect ratio and wider field of view. Um, but overall, it was pretty close. I didn't have a floor plan or dimensions, so everything was just a guess. But by using these far doors as a scale reference, we can kind of build the scale of this bathroom section pretty easily. And then I just simply guessed wrong on the length of these vanities. Um, back on the Metri website, there was a second image that gives sort of, it sort of shows how this end of the room is constructed and what the scale looks like. So just by comparing the size of a tub to the length of this wall and the depth of these two doors here and then this little edge, um, we were able to get pretty close in the render. So that's what I'm going to be going through. Um, I'm going to flip back to SketchUp and we'll start going through how the scene was constructed. Okay, so if you've got a little bit of SketchUp experience, there shouldn't be anything overly complicated about the construction of this scene. It's just a bathroom made up of rectangular wall components. And in some cases, we cut holes for the window, the doors, or over here, the shower area. Um, and extrude everything up to the height that we want it. So the most common process for modeling structures that people use is to trace out the floor plan or import, um, you know, vectors from a, an external application. Select the walls, hit P to activate the push-pull tool, and then bring these up to the height that we want them. So I wanted my ceiling to be 10 feet tall, so I just type in 10 feet, hit enter, and we've got our structure, right? And that's completely valid, but it's not really the way that I like to work when I'm doing a model for rendering. I actually prefer to keep every individual wall section in its own group. And there are a couple reasons for this. One, it makes it really easy to hide things. Uh, if you need to get a better view while you're working, for example, I can just hide stuff, zoom in on this section here and start modeling off this wall. For example, if I'm working on the vanities, um, and that's also useful when you're rendering because it allows us to set up camera angles that we might not be able to get inside this room. For example, if I'm trying to get an angled view or something and I, I'm setting up my view, backing up, and suddenly I'm in the wall. So having everything separated off into groups just makes it sort of easier to get nice camera angles, a little bit more pleasant to work with, makes it really easy to move things around if you need to and it keeps the scene nice and organized. Okay, the last thing I wanna say about laying in the shape of the room is that all your structural elements should have realistic volume or thickness. Um, this might be obvious to some people, but I do see a lot of models uh, with walls, ceilings, or floors that are just a single plane of SketchUp geometry, and that's never a good idea when you need to model or render the model um, because light needs to interact with this model in a realistic way, so make sure your walls have a little bit of volume to them. Same thing goes for your floor. So you can see I've just taken the floor plane and extruded it down by two or three inches. The ceiling, if I unhide that, is a little bit more complicated because it has this inset in it. But if we look at it from the outside, it's not just a single plane, it's an actual volume, 
that light can interact with. Too often I will see models where someone just took a rectangle tool, plopped a ceiling plane on top, and so now we just have a single SketchUp plane sitting here on the top of the walls, when actually it would be better to extrude this, not, not just better, it would, it's essential for rendering in Podium to extrude the ceiling up, you know, even just three inches or something like that is fine. Make that into a group, maybe extend it a couple inches over the edge. Um, and this just means that when we're, when we're inside the model and we're rendering the image, light is gonna bounce around the scene correctly and not cause any render artifacts. If the ceiling is a single SketchUp plane, as we had before, what happens is where the ceiling interacts with the walls, we get these lighting artifacts that I call light leaks, where it looks like light is actually leaking through the edge. So from the inside, we'll see, you'll see like these little photon looking artifacts just gathered along the edges. It doesn't look good at all. So just make sure you take care to model your walls, ceiling, and floor with realistic thickness. And always check your face orientation. So if I go into SketchUp monochrome mode, it shows me which direction my faces are. Um, let me just draw out a quick example. So if the, when you're in monochrome mode, if the face is blue, it means you're seeing the back face. The podium camera should always, always, always see the front face. Um, these blue faces are meant to be on the inside of a volume, right? So if this is, I'll actually get rid of this cube and show you on this wall section here because it's a little bit thicker and I should be able to zoom inside. So when we're rendering this scene, the camera is sitting right about here and you can see everything in view of the camera is white, which means we're always seeing the front faces. The blue back face should only be on the inside of a volume, which means if it's on the inside of a volume, it's never gonna be seen by the SketchUp camera or the Podium camera. Um, I did notice one problem, which is this glass is actually reversed. Um, so it would be a good idea. If you do notice, when you're in monochrome mode, if you do notice blue faces, what you wanna do is just select it, right click and reverse. And that corrects the face orientation. Um, I know th that probably sounds a little bit abstract and you might think, well, what's the big deal? It's the same problem as the single plane sketch of geometry. It just causes problems when light photons are bouncing around the room. And sometimes it causes artifacts or light leaks, as I mentioned before. And one more time, just to recap, on the left side of the image here, we see the wrong way to do it. So we've got a single plane being used as a wall and it's got an incorrect face orientation. So the back face, the blue back face is facing the inside of the room and is visible to the camera. And it's just a single plane with no thickness. Then on the right side of the image is the correct way to construct a room. So the wall, ceiling and floor have thickness and the face orientation is correct. We're only seeing front faces in that image. So that is how to correctly set up your model and let's move on to the next step. Okay, so I'm back here looking at the reference image and I think the next thing I wanna demonstrate is how to add the crown molding, baseboards, and construct the mirrors using the finishing profiles from Podium Browser. So let me go back to SketchUp and show you how that's done. I've already got this example set up. So if I turn on molding example, you can see I've just traced the shape of the ceiling using the rectangle and line tools. And so now I have the contour of the ceiling in this continuous path. And I've downloaded the very square finishing profile from Podium Browser. This is the six and a quarter inch very square crown. So it actually comes into the scene facing the wrong direction and also slightly extruded. So I can just move this a little bit off to the left. And all I needed to do was rotate this 90 degrees so that it's basically oriented correctly. And then I explode, select one of the end faces, control V, and then 
paste it into place and it needs to line up exactly with the curve. So basically with your move tool activated, all you have to do is come right down here to this corner vertex and snap it right onto the curve, which from some angles can be tricky, but just like that. Okay. So let me delete that and get it out of the way. Now all we need to do is triple click this edge. I only want the path to be selected before I activate the follow me tool. So I'm gonna hold control and shift and then just drag over the profile to deselect it. Now I can activate the follow me tool. Click right here on this face and it's gonna extrude along the curve. Okay, so that is how you create the crown molding. The faces are reversed, so I'm just gonna triple click to select this entire thing, right click, reverse faces, right click again and make it into a group. And now we have our crown molding profile. So all I need to do is move this down to the place it's gonna be. I'm gonna use this top vertex for an inference. Select the move tool right here, hit the up arrow to constrain on the blue axis, and then I'm gonna snap it to the top of the ceiling. Okay, so now the top of the crown molding is hitting exactly where it needs to, even with the top of the ceiling, and this bottom section is flush with the wall. And if I bring the camera down here into the room, we've done it. We've got our crown molding. So the process is exactly the same for the baseboards. Um, it's a little trickier because of how detailed this geometry is, so I'm not going to demonstrate the baseboards, but you do it exactly the same way. You can even extrude them by hand if it's easier. Like around here, I probably wouldn't bother with the follow me tool. I would just come in and I think it was the seven and a quarter inch baseboard. Basically just come in, rotate it around, hit M, constrain on the red axis, snap it in place and then just push pull it into the shape that you need. Um, this corner is sort of tricky. You could use intersections or you could use the follow me tool. I can't remember how I did it the first time I modeled this. Um, chances are I just rotated it manually and then created an, an intersection between the two. But that's how you do the crown molding in the baseboards and the process for the vanities, the vanity mirrors was exactly the same. So if I turn on that layer, each one of these mirrors is just a face in the center with a casing profile wrapped around it. So let me turn off the molding real quick and we'll recreate one of these mirrors. So I'll just grab the rectangle tool, draw out a mirror in the shape that we need it. And then we need to come back into Podium Browser and get the casing that we need. So I use the very square four and a half inch casing. And we just need to snap it into place. So I'm gonna rotate it. And then again on the other axis so that it's facing this way. I believe that's negative 90. Okay, and now we need to snap it into place. So the slanted end is what faces the center of the mirror. So I'm gonna come over here and we'll grab this corner and snap it right onto the edge. Okay, now what I want to do is Actually, I'm just gonna right click, explode this, select the top face, control C, delete all of that, and I'm gonna paste it into place. Okay, so now we only have the profile shape that we need. Uh, and I'm gonna delete the center for now. Actually, I think we can leave the center. So let me triple click to select that face and activate the follow me tool. I believe we want to come from the bottom because this is, nope, this is the front face up top. So click right here. And there we have it, our mirror. Again, the faces are reversed. So I'm going to triple click and reverse faces. And now the mirror is reversed. So I'm going to right click one more time, reverse face, and we're good to go. Um, it came in with a gray, comp uh, gray material on it. So all we would need to do is color pick whatever material that we want paste it, and then eventually we would add 
a chrome material to this front face. Um, there's one other thing you can do. If you, if you have a mirror or a picture frame or something like that that's sort of close to the camera and you want to get, if you want to be able to see, we call it a contact shadow between the frame and the picture, you might want to leave like a millimeter or two gap. So what I could do is come in here, select this face and hit control X to remove it. I'm going to make this into its own group so that it doesn't intersect with anything. Go to edit, paste in place. So now the mirror and the frame of the mirror are separate. I'm going to turn this into its own group as well. These are two, these are both separate groups now. I'm just gonna select the mirror and let's move it back as far as we want. I'm gonna say just two millimeters. Um, that's a very subtle detail, but it, it sometimes helps um, give an impression of depth and realness in a render. It helps, it helps create shadows between surfaces, which if you look around the real world, um, for example, a coffee table, a coffee mug sitting on a table, you're going to see a slight shadow beneath it. So it's a good idea to leave slight gaps when you render. You just want to emphasize small nuances like that. Um, it adds to the subtlety and realism in the render. Okay, so that's pretty much the process for the crown molding, baseboards, and mirrors. Um, I think we're about done covering the modeling and stuff. In the next section, I'm just really quickly gonna talk about the vanities um, and cover a few more details in the bathroom section over there. Okay, I'm not gonna say too, too much about the vanities because this isn't meant to be an in-depth SketchUp modeling tutorial. I think there's better YouTube channels that you can go to if you need help learning how to model something like this. Um, but I will say a few things with regard to how to make these look good in a render. So if I zoom in really close on these vanities, you can see all the edges in this model have a slight round corner on them. So if I zoom in here, I think this countertop is one, two, th three segments, and it's a, probably about a two millimeter or three millimeter bevel. The same goes for these cabinets down below. They're a little bit tighter, probably only one or two. Yeah, I guess it's about two millimeters and the same three segment bevel. The reason we do this is that it helps the model interact with light more realistically. So if you look around the room that you're sitting in, look around at the edge of objects, uh, coffee tables, the corner of a wall, um, you know, the edge of a cabinet, you're gonna notice that they're not mathematically precise. They don't, the, ed the edges don't come together at a perfect 90 degree angle the way a piece of SketchUp geometry would. So if I model a rectangle in SketchUp and extrude it out, these edges are 100% precise, like they were machined in a, you know, made out of steel in a machine shop or something like that. But this just isn't how most things work in the real world. So what we do is we add a slight bevel. So if I come back to the reference image and zoom in on, let's see. Let's see if we can zoom in right on the edge of one of these countertops. You notice this clearly isn't a perfectly sharp edge. And the same goes for, yeah, you can, you can see it on these cabinets as well. And what that does is if we mimic that in our model, it helps the model correctly catch reflections and highlights. So let me go back to Photoshop and show you what this looks like in the render. So this is the, this is the finished render. And you can see anywhere there's an edge. So over here on the far wall, we can see there's a slight highlight above the tub on the edge of these countertops. Here's a zoomed in version and I'll, I've, called out where the edge highlights are. We've got a highlight right here on the edge of the countertop, on the edge of the sink, right here on this little um, this little edge above the tub. 
If I zoom in even closer, we can see these edge highlights on the cabinets. This sort of detail and subtlety isn't possible unless you add a slight round corner. So the way we do this in SketchUp, I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna just hide the vanities. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna remodel this full thing, but we'll just draw out a rectangle. Pull it up. Oops. I guess it doesn't matter how far we pull it up. Right, so if we were doing a vanity, it would be something like this. Slight edge, and we would extrude the, the cabinets out of this. But what I would do is make this whole thing into a group. Then we need to divide it up. Uh, depending on how many cabinets we need. So grab that edge, bring it to the other side, divided by, let's say, four. Eh, that looks better. Divided by five, and then we would do the same thing vertically. So take this top edge. I said I wasn't going to do this, but here we are. Uh, divided by four. Okay, so now... we need a slight gap in between each of these cabinets. So I like to overemphasize the size of gaps so that you can see them in the render, right? So if we go back to the reference image, these, these gaps between the, the cabinets are actually pretty pronounced. And I probably could have gone even a little bit further, but I think I did four millimeter gaps in my model. And all things considered, it, it looks pretty good. It's it's close enough. Okay, so uh, with the offset tool, four millimeters, actually two millimeters, because we're gonna do that on each one. Control T, double click to repeat the action. Okay, and then what I would do is just grab this face, Control C, leave the group, edit, paste in place. So now this is its own piece of geometry. Pull it out to the, the depth that we need. I think that looks fine. And select this whole thing, right click, make component. Okay, so now this is a component. Nope, actually it didn't turn into a component. Click create, there, now we're good. Um, if I was being a little bit more precious about this, I would want it to line up with the top and we would want it to come out just slightly. Okay. We can hold control to duplicate. X3. Okay, and we've got our cabinets. Now, to add that round corner, what I'm getting at is we need to install a plugin called Fredo Round Corner. So I use the Sketchication Extension Store. You can do it from the Extension Warehouse as well. I just like this. Um, it has some plugins that don't show up in the Extension Warehouse. Type in Fredo Round Corner. So there's two different versions, and this is an, ar an archived version, I guess. There it is. So you would just click the Install button. It does have a dependency that you need to install called libfredo. That's his library that you need to install to use most of his plugins. Um, but this is sort of off topic. You can look it up on your own. Um, just know that Round Corner is the plugin that you need and it's well documented on sketchcation.com. So once you have that installed, it's very simple to use. You just select any edges that you need to be rounded or you can select a f an entire face. And if so, if you select a face, that means it's gonna, it's gonna automatically round all four of these edges. And that's what I want. So I select the face. Fredo round corner is right here. It's just three buttons. You can do a sharp 
a sharp bevel, a sharp corner, which is just a slightly different profile on the end vertices, or you can do a round corner, and that's what I want. So I activate round corner, I choose the offset that I want, I'm gonna say two millimeters, the number of segments, that's the number of segments on the radius. And usually if it's gonna be small, you can get away with either two or three. Um, I like to use three just in case, just so that it looks a little bit cleaner. Uh, whoops, I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, then what you do is you click anywhere else and there it is, it's rounded. Okay, so that's a, a basic demonstration of Fredo round corner, and that's how we can get these nice looking edge highlights, nice realistic looking edge highlights. Because I promise you, if you look around in the real world, um, most edges are not perfectly sharp. Uh, I, I believe the sink that I used was certainly in Podium Browser under bathroom, sinks, and it's one of the ones that sits flush beneath the, beneath the surface of the counter. So, okay, it was this Kohler Catherine. So I'll download that into my scene. And then I would wanna have guidelines or something so that I know where to place it. But you click there and it automatically cuts a hole into the surface. And you can see we've got this sink sitting flush with the countertop and just below. And then actually, um, I was able to find a faucet that looks close enough from Podium Browser as well. So this was, uh, let me get this new version out of the way and we'll check what faucet that was. It's called Oxy Spot Resistant. So I just type in Oxy Spot, and the original color was brushed nickel, right? And I think I changed the scale a little bit. No, actually, scale is the same. All I did was change the color of the material. So come in here, paint bucket, and in the edit tab, I think I just gave it a little bit of color, mess with the hue saturation, and value until I found a color that I liked. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the vanities. Let's um, scoot over here and just briefly discuss the bathroom and shower section. So if I flip back to Photoshop, I've got this secondary reference image opened up and I sort of just annotated what I decided to include and what I decided I didn't need. Obviously we need the tub and the window because in the final image, the tub is clearly visible and the window is the main source of light in the scene. And it's also visible in the reflection. Um, we also need this splash guard behind the tub because I think that's an important detail. Uh, as I called out before, it causes this nice highlight and sort of creates a breakup between the wall and the bath area. And then we also need to model this little edge where the faucet is sitting. So if I go back to that secondary reference, the faucet sitting right here, which we don't actually see in the render, um, but I included it anyway. And then just to save a little bit of time, I decided not to include all this shower hardware. If we look at the reference image, it is actually visible in these reflections here and here, um, but I forgot about it. And so it's not present in my final image, but I don't think it detracts too much. So back to SketchUp. Um, the tub that was used is called the Kohler Sunstruck 6338, and that's in Podium Browser. So if you just go to Podium Browser and type in Kohler Sunstruck, you'll find it, and it's the 6368 size. Uh, make sure you rotate it correctly because this one is meant to be sitting against a wall. You can see there's a lip on this side. The faucet, I just used the exact same one from the vanities. Um, if we look at that secondary reference image, it's a pretty close match. Um, so I, I thought it was fine to just duplicate the same one as before. The panel here, I'm not sure what this is technically called. I just called it a splash guard. It's just a rectangle and then it's extruded a tiny amount. P 
P, extrude, and then once again we use Fredo round corner. So I select that face, and actually this tool only works if it's in a group. So you have to group it, select the face, Fredo round corner, click off anywhere, and that's how you create that panel. That's mirrored on both sides. Uh, the window is not from Podium Browser. I ended up modeling this by hand just because I didn't find anything that looked quite right in Podium Browser, and I had a I had a third reference image, and so I just went off this. It looked like there was a, a sort of rounded edge and then a taper toward the center of the frame, so that's what I tried to imitate. So if we zoom in on SketchUp right here, you can see I've got this tapered diagonal, and then I used Fredo round corner on this edge here. The bottom piece has a one segment, maybe two segment bevel on it as well. Um, this isn't super prominent in the final image, but I think it's worth putting some time into modeling those details. If we look at the render, it's not only is it the main source of light in the room, but it's pretty clearly visible here in the mirror. And by spending some time putting in those details, we get this nice alternating pattern of light and then dark, light again, and then dark toward the edge. So just pay close attention to detail and observe your reference if you need to model something by hand like that. But otherwise, Podium Browser actually has a few hundred windows. Um, so if you need something quickly, just start here and scroll through until you find something you like. The door comes from Podium Browser, and that's door number 15. So under Hardware and Construction, Doors, there's a few dozen interior doors at least, and I just use this door number 15 interior. And then the final thing is the shower area. So checking back with the reference image one more time, for the shower section we need this small piece of glass up top and then the door beneath it, and then two vertical panels uh, held in place by these metal brackets. So switching back to SketchUp, that's exactly what we did. We've just got these two vertical panels, the door, and then this smaller rectangle piece and the hardware, I actually just copy pasted from an old model. I thought it fit the scene perfectly fine. Um, and if you can reuse stuff that you've modeled in the past, you always should. So these panels are just rectangles that are extruded a tiny amount, about, let's see, they're three eighths of an inch thick. So we, we paint, use the paint bucket to put a glass material on the front, and then we paint a darker material along the edges. And that just helps them read a little bit better in the final image. If you look at the reference, toward the edge of these panels, you can sort of see there's this darkening effect. And so by painting that dark material on the edge of the glass, we get this really nice, you know, it, th there's, there's a lot of clarity on these edges. We can clearly see where the different glass panels are. Um, and it just, it looks nice and crisp. Okay, so that's how the the glass door was modeled. I'll include this in the file that I provide in case you don't want to model it again. Um, and then the only other thing I did in the shower because I forgot about the hardware and faucet and stuff, I just sectioned off this area where these ornate tiles were supposed to be located and then framed it with a little raised piece of, it's like a semicircular frame on the top and bottom edges. And I use the follow me tool for that. Uh, so that is the bath and shower section. The only thing we haven't covered now is the ceiling, I think. So if I turn on my ceiling layer, there's nothing complicated about it. Um, I mentioned before that it's it's really important for this to have realistic volume. And in this case, that counts even more because it's got an inset. So if I grab this corner constrained to the blue axis and just raise this up so we can see underneath it. Um, this isn't difficult to model. All you need to do is, you know, I took the rectangle tool, drew a rectangle in the center, push-pull, extrude it up, and then I'll recreate this intersection. Okay, so let's, let's say you got this far on your own and you wanted that raised inset because in the reference image, you can see that there's a, there's a gap and it's got some thickness and then it pushes back a little bit. So there's like a lip and then it's, it's raised a few inches more. So the way we do that is you activate the push pull tool 
hold the control button and that's going to instead of instead of extruding this straight up it's going to extrude it and leave an edge behind and what i can do is select this face and delete it okay so now we have an intersection i need to reverse these faces so that we're seeing the front face bring this down a little bit more and then what we do is we push this back a few inches on each side. So let's just say, let's say six inches, double click to repeat on all sides. And that's exactly how you create that ceiling inset. Um, and then in the reference, the, the final thing is this vent and I got one from Podium Browser, so. Uh, ceiling detail was vent 03, and then it looked like in the reference image there was also sort of a little panel. So I, I found this blanking plate in Podium Browser. That's not actually what that's supposed to be used for, but it sort of matched what I was seeing in... Let's see if I can justify my myself. Right, so there's this... There's this little raised plate right here, just above the door. And so that's what that was meant to mimic. Okay, I think that pretty much covers model setup. So in the next section, we'll start talking about materials and lighting, and then move on to producing some renders. Uh, if you've stuck with it this long, thank you. We're getting really close to the end. I think you'll find as you continue to work in SketchUp, if you can get a model to this level of finish, it really only takes, you know, another five or 10 minutes to set up materials and lighting. So if you can get this far, you're well on your way to producing really nice images. All right, so let's take a look at podium material settings. Okay, as you can see, I've duplicated the model and removed most of the materials and textures from the scene so we can go about rebuilding the materials in this image. Now, most of the time your image isn't gonna look like this. The first thing I wanna mention about materials in Podium is that any object that you download from Podium browser is already going to have, it's already going to be textured and it's already going to have Podium material properties applied to it. So if we look at this bath, for example, and I open the material properties window, grab the eyedropper and color pick this, you can see it's already got this Podium baths color white acrylic material applied to it. And that's 94% diffuse and 6% reflective. So that just means it's a lightly reflective acrylic surface. We don't need to make any changes that's ready to render. The same goes for faucets, um, right? So the electrical outlet probably has a slightly reflective, 95% diffuse, 5% reflection, pretty much the same material as the, um, as the bathtub. The sink, 85% diffuse, 15% reflection, so that means this is just slightly more reflective than the other services we've looked at. And if we look at this in the image, that that's relatively apparent. So we've got a moderately reflective surface. The faucets. So I mentioned before that the this faucet originally came into the scene with a brushed nickel material on it. Um, but the second point I want to make about Podium Browser items is we're definitely not stuck with the material that comes in on the item. We can change this out if we want to. So if we zoom out a little bit and look at all the objects that are left in this vanity section, the faucets, this light fitting, these towel rings, and this second suspended light fixture, we can see that they all share a material in common. So what happened was I decided I wanted some consistency on this side of the room. And I had decided to use this Hinkley Quentin suspended light fixture right above the vanities and mirrors and stuff. And so if you come into the material properties window and color pick this material, oops, need to zoom in a little bit. It's already got this metallic material applied to it. It's 92% diffuse and 8% reflective with a blurred reflection on it. And so I decided to just take that material and apply it to everything else. So. Using the faucet as an example again, as I mentioned, this was originally a brushed nickel material. And all we need to do is select these faces. You do need to 
Make sure you open up the group and actually select the faces. Don't just take the paint bucket and paint it to the outside of the group because that can cause problems. So arrow, triple click into the group, paint bucket and repaint. Repeat that on all three items. And we've successfully changed the material. So I did the same thing, applied that same material to the towel ring, the hardware on the drawers and cabinets, and it's also on the faucet next to the bath. Okay, so that's how you take a material off one Podium Browser object and transfer it to other items in the scene. Now we just need to continue applying textures and materials to the rest of the objects in the room. And for most of this, we can just use materials directly from Podium Browser. So let's start with the mirrors. For the mirrors, I want something that's highly reflective with a low diffuse value. So I'll just come into Podium Browser and type Chrome, download the material cube. It's gonna come into the scene applied to a cube. And now to put this on the mirrors, I just need to grab the paint bucket color pick that and open up these components, select the face and paint it on the surface. Do the other side. Okay, and the mirrors are done. So if we open the material properties dialog, grab the color picker, that object is 90% reflective and only 10% diffuse. So it's a highly reflective object with a very low diffuse value. This can also be applied to a few other items in the room. So we've got Chrome on same exact material, I believe on this hardware here. Actually, it's a little bit different. The value is 88 and 12. Those very slight changes won't really make it look any different in, in the render. You can have a little bit of variation, but as far as that is a high reflection value and a low diffuse, it's gonna look like a metallic Chrome object. Same thing is applied to the door handles the drainage in the bathtub, and probably a few other places in the scene. Um, but that takes care of the chrome. Now for the floor, if we look at the reference, it's clearly a tile floor, highly reflective. We can see the reflection of the bathtub, the walls, the cabinets. Um, so I just opened up Podium Browser, go under Materials, Tiles Floor, and I scrolled through until I found something I liked. Now, my choice wasn't exactly what was in the reference, but I think I ended up going with one of these Florida tile marble floors. I'm pretty sure it was something really close to this. I believe this was it actually. Florida tile, gallant, bianco, which means pretty much white. Actually, it might've been that Carrera one, but either way, so that comes into the scene. Yeah, the one I chose was whiter. So let me delete that. I've actually got all the Podium Browser materials in this scene right over here. Unhide all. So this was the marble floor that I chose. Let me color pick that and we'll apply it to the floor material. Oops. Grab the face, paint bucket, paint it on. That tile is 18 feet. The, the texture is meant to represent an 18 foot by 18 foot square. If you wanted to change the texture size, you could either select the face, right click, texture, position, and change it manually with the handles, but that's sort of tricky to do. What I like to do instead is use the material tray. So right under use texture image, you can change the texture size right here. So if I wanted these tiles to be a little bit smaller, change that from 18 feet to 12 feet, hit enter. And as you can see, we've got smaller tiles on the floor. Now the Values on this are 87% diffuse and 13% reflective. No blur on that. Um, this is a reflective floor and we, we don't want it blurred because we're clearly seeing the outline of these objects. It's not, it's not a mirrored surface like the, the chrome material from before, but we still want a relatively sharp reflection. A good example of when to use a blurred reflection is this faucet. Right, so we're seeing reflections, but it's not quite as sharp as on the floor or on the mirror, especially. We get the same effect in the podium render. So this is what a blurred reflection would look like. And the properties on that, one more time, are 
8% reflection and blurred reflection is checked on the faucet. Okay, what's next? How about the glass? So I talked about the glass a little bit earlier and mentioned that it was set up in a particular way to emphasize the edges. So I'll just grab this panel here and show you how it was set up. Move this off to the side. As I mentioned, this is a 3 eighths of an inch thick piece of geometry. And on the front surface, we have a transparent glass material. So under material properties, this is 2% diffuse, 65% transparent, and 33% reflective. You could raise or lower that reflection depending on what sort of look you want in your own image. And then on the sides of the glass pane, we're using a much darker, it's like a dark blue color, 94% diffuse and only 5% transparency. No reflection on it, because the whole purpose of this rim material is to just emphasize the edges in the render. Okay, so that's how I set up the glass panels. I'm gonna get rid of that. And what's next? Uh, paint colors. So in the reference image, we can clearly see there's two different tones of paint. Over here in the vanity section, we've got this slightly more saturated brownish color. And back here in the bath section, uh, it's a much more neutral sort of beige type paint. And this is even more apparent in one of the other reference images. So in this second image, we can clearly see that this entire bath alcove is using a very neutral um, beige looking paint, whereas the, the paint over the vanities is much more saturated. So what I did was went to Podium Browser and under Materials, we have a large selection of Faro and Ball paint colors. These are just taken straight from the Faro and Ball website. We match the RGB values. Um, and what I used was the octagon yellow and also ferro and ball cream. So these are right over here. And applying them is just like anything else, right? Grab the paint bucket, paste it where you need it. Over here was the ferro and ball cream. This is on all of these walls, but I'm not going to waste time doing that. This, um, this wall here is a little bit different in the sense that it has three different materials on it. Uh, so we've got the ferro and ball cream color up top here, and then down here we've got the acrylic tile splash guard and a much more, it's white, it's almost pure white, but it has a little bit of grayness to it. So for that section, I on the tile, I actually just copied it directly from the tub and pasted it on the tile because they're, they're just a, a slightly reflective plastic material. And then for this, I created a brand new material. So under materials, you can click create new material and I called it bath wall white, but I didn't keep it 100% white. I reduced the value to 95. So you can see it's just slightly gray. Select that face, paint bucket, now it's bath wall white, which is actually gray. And I, th I think I gave it like a, yeah, a 6% reflection, which doesn't actually show up very much in the render, but it can't really hurt anything. So that's the paint colors on the walls. What's left? The shower floor. So if I hide this door here and zoom in, this is just a pretty small mosaic tile. And this is from Podium Browser as well. In the reference image, this is actually we zoom in real close. It's actually a penny tile, um, but we didn't have one in Podium Browser, so I just picked something similar. Mosaic tiles are under Tiles Mosaic, and I scrolled through and found just a, a small black tile that looks pretty close. It's really small in the render, so we don't need to worry too much about it. Material properties on that are 85% diffuse, 15% reflection, it's got a blurred reflection and it also has a 10% bump depth. Uh, you're barely gonna notice that in the render, but it's there. Um, and that's how the material was set up. And then the final thing was this, in the reference image, this geometric tile texture. It's actually a tile, but I didn't have anything like this in Podium Browser. Uh, and so I just looked on Google and ended up finding a seamless texture that looks pretty close. It's not. We don't have any tiles. There's not a lot of detail, but you can barely see it. It's only visible in a reflection. So I just created a material out of this. Uh, to do that, we would go to 
create new material. We'll call it geometric tile, use texture image, select that image wherever you saved it, and then you set the texture size. So I can't remember exactly what it was, but maybe 3.5 feet by 3.5, or I guess it's not totally square, whoops. Put it on that face, and that's pretty close. The scale might be a little bit different, but you get the idea. That's how you bring in a texture image and use it in your model. That texture was also here in the shower, so go ahead and paint it here, here, and here. And I believe that fully takes care of materials. Oh, oh you know what? There's one thing. If we take a look back at the reference image, we can clearly see the countertop here is pretty reflective. We're, we're definitely seeing a reflection of the faucet on the countertop. So we just need to go back to SketchUp and create a reflective material for this surface. So I'll go under materials, create new material, uh, reflective countertop, and I'm gonna leave it pure white actually and just hit okay, no texture. Select this item, paint bucket, and we've got reflective countertop applied to that surface. And now it's probably gonna be just around 14. So 86% diffuse and 14% reflection, I think is what I used. Click apply, close, and there's only one more material we need to look at, and that is this lampshade. So going back to the reference image, the lampshade is like a translucent, canvas looking material. We can clearly see the lights slightly through the lampshade and we're getting this, this nice darkening effect toward the edges. So the way I set this up in Podium is open material properties, color pick, and I used 74% diffuse, only 26% transparency, no reflection at all on it, and then turn on blurred transparency and that just gives the material a translucent effect. So going back to the reference, we see the lampshade here, and then in the render, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. We've got the same, you know, the light is visible through the lampshade. We're getting this darkening effect toward the edges, and it has an overall translucent appearance. Okay, so that's the lampshade, and I think with that we have finished materials, and we're ready to move on to lighting and rendering. All right, we made it to the fun part. Now, I've got the reference image opened up, and as you can see, the lighting in this scene is a combination of natural light coming in through the window and then several artificial light sources. So we've got these recessed lights over here and over the shower, the two suspended chandeliers, and then these wall-mounted fixtures above the vanities. So going back to the render, you can see that I included them all. Now that's actually more artificial light sources than I would usually try to turn on in a daylit scene. But because the reference image had them all, I decided to just go with it. Uh, I did cut some corners on these chandeliers. I didn't remodel these sort of complex shapes by hand. I just chose something from Podium Browser that I liked. Uh, I did go ahead and model the wall fixtures. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Uh, looking at the reference, I think I made the tubing a little bit too thick, but it works pretty well anyway. And then these recessed lights are just recessed fixtures from the Podium Browser library. So let's go back to SketchUp and start with these chandeliers and I'll show you how I set them up. So this was the Hinkley Lighting Quentin 4814KZ and I'm just gonna download this into the scene and show you some of the changes that I made. I'll just put it right next to the other one so you can compare them. And the first thing you'll notice is that I shortened my version. I wanted it to hang a little bit closer to the ceiling so all I did was opened up the component, select all of this, activate the move tool, move it up, and then I just shorten the tubing. Although actually I think I ended up grabbing that edge anyway, so it shortened the tubing automatically. So that's the first change. The second change has to do with lighting in ProWalker GPU compared to SU Podium. So SU Podium has an option in the settings here called Soft Omni. And what that does is it softens the edges of the shadows that are cast by, so by Omni lights, which is what's used in this light fitting. ProWalker GPU doesn't have the soft Omni option. Uh, and I knew I wanted to render this scene using ProWalker. So what I did was 
instead of using Omni lights, I changed the light source to a light emitting material. So the way that I did that, I came in here, opened up the bulb component, drag select these Omni lights, click delete to get rid of them. Straightforward so far. And then I just created an LEM material that I wanted to paste onto these bulbs. So let me close the group. If I grab the eyedropper and select one of these bulbs, you can see we've got a material called light bulbs applied to the surface of these lights, and it's got a light power of seven. So instead of using an omni light, we're using a light emitting material to cast light from this light fitting. And I can just recreate that real quick. So all we need to do is in the materials tray, click create new material, light bulb example. I gave it a tiny bit of color in my other one, um, but you don't have to. We'll just go with white for this. Click OK, select these faces, grab the paint bucket, paint it on, come up to podium material properties. You can see we've got light bulb example selected and give it a light power, whatever's required for your scene. I had done a few tests and decided seven looked pretty good. Click apply. Close. And if you ever wanted to change the color later on, you know, you can either come to the color wheel and do it that way, or I like to use the hue saturation blackness sliders. Give it a little bit of warmth. Okay, so that's the chandelier. Now, the next example is these recessed lights. And this is also from Podium Browser. So if I come up to Podium browser and type in Gianni. It was the mood fixed round trim. So in order to get these to cut into the ceiling, you have to open up the group, download it into the scene. And let's zoom in. You can see that I made a very similar change because this light fixture also uses an Omni light. So I just went ahead and opened it up delete the Omni, and then I swapped it out for an LEM material. So the way I got the circle in there is to select this face just above it. I have an extension called Add Center Point, and it very conveniently can add a center point to any face. So that's in Sketchication, I believe. I added a center point there. I just drew a line straight down as a guideline grab the circle tool, and then I just drew a circle straight out from the center to the edge. And now we have a face that we can apply the LEM to. I won't recreate this one, but I will select it. So this, I just called it recessed LEM, and that also had a light power of seven. So I can just open this one more time, paste it on, and that takes care of the recessed lights. Okay, the last thing we need to look at is the wall-mounted light fixtures over here on the vanities. So, as I mentioned, this was custom modeled specifically for the scene, uh, but there's nothing difficult about it. If I hide this lampshade, you can see it's pretty much constructed exactly, using exactly the same method as the chandeliers. In fact, I think I copied and pasted these when I was remodeling the light fixture. Uh, but I did change the LEM to something slightly redder. So if I come here into the Material Properties dialog and color pick that, I just have an LEM called Pinkish, and I gave it a light power of 12. Um, I was experimenting with adding sort of a reddish, rosy tone into the light, and I think it comes through a little bit in the render. It's not overly red, um, but you can see it does have a tiny bit of color to it. So that is the three light sources on hide last. There was one other thing I wanted to show you, and this is a really useful lighting tip for both SU Podium and Pro Walker GPU. So if I come to the exterior here and hide my ceiling layer, you can see behind the bathroom area, I modeled this square enclosure, and inside of it, I've got this large plane with an LEM applied called Behind Camera LEM. And it's just got a really low light power, a light power of one, uh, and the reason I did this is because this is one of the best ways to boost the illumination in your scene. 
instead of trying to place additional light sources, you just put a large light emitting material where it's not going to be seen by the camera, but where it can cast illumination into the render. And so I didn't necessarily need more light in this particular render because there are already quite a few light sources and a pretty strong light coming in through the window, but I just wanted to show you this technique in case you were unfamiliar with it. So you can place large LEM panels anywhere off camera and use them to brighten up a scene or add a little bit of color, which is sort of how it worked in my case. I kept the light power really low because ProWalker's LEMs tend to be a little bit overpowered compared to Podium. So I set the light power at one, gave it a sort of reddish tone that matches the lights on the wall here and let that just add a little bit of illumination into the room. Okay, so we are done setting up lighting. I think we can move on to rendering with ProWalker GPU. Okay, before you open up ProWalker GPU, it's a really good idea to create a SketchUp scene to save your camera view. That way, if you move the camera, you can return right back to that exact same position. You also wanna make sure you have a field of view that you're happy with. So under camera, field of view, I set my focal length to 24 millimeters. Uh, and that's a relatively standard lens for interior photography. You can set the focal length in either degrees, meaning like a 130 degree field of view, or focal length, which is measured in millimeters like camera lenses. I don't know how true it is, but I read somewhere that the focal length of the human eye was somewhere between 22 and 24 millimeters. So I usually use that as a starting point. And I did think it matched the reference image pretty well. Okay, so. For the camera position, I used the right orthographic camera because we're looking straight down the hall. I don't want any perspective distortion. I want my vertical lines to be completely straight up and down. Now, if you were trying to get a skewed image from a diagonal camera view and you needed to correct your verticals, you can go to extensions, SC Podium version 2.6 tools, reset tilt, and that just brings the vertical lines back to a, a straight up and down position. Okay, so back to scene six, and we'll go ahead and open up ProWalker. That's the little footsteps icon here. Okay, so after clicking the ProWalker icon, the model and textures are exported to the render engine, and after a few seconds, we see a very noisy preview image appear in the ProWalker viewport. Now, the first thing to know about ProWalker is that it's a progressive render engine, so the process is a little bit different than SU Podium. Podium calculates an image by dividing the canvas into little squares, almost like a grid, and then it renders the image in several discrete stages, indirect lighting, ray tracing, anti-aliasing, and then an image is saved. With ProWalker, the image is rendered in progressive iterations called samples, and the image is gradually refined to produce a realistic result. So the longer we let calculations run, the clearer the image gets. If the render is interrupted by a camera movement or a change to lighting, the sample count resets to zero and the process immediately begins again. So down here in the bottom left corner of the interface, we see a sample count, rendering in progress, 15 samples. Right now it's at 15, and as you can see, the image is still quite noisy, but as additional samples are added, the noise will gradually be removed and a clean image will eventually emerge. ProWalker also has a built-in denoising algorithm, which is meant to speed up the render process. Um, the render engine's NVIDIA iRay, so we use the NVIDIA AI Optics denoiser, and if I turn it on right here with this icon, you can see the noise disappears immediately, but the image becomes sort of soft or blurry. So one thing to know is that the denoiser is really, really useful, but it isn't magical. We still need to let ProWalker calculate a reasonable number of samples before we get what I would consider a usable finished image. So in a sense, we can think about it in two different ways. When the denoiser is off, the image starts noisy and gradually becomes clear as the noise is removed and additional samples are calculated. When the denoiser is on, the image starts off blurry and then it gradually refines toward a much sharper result, okay? I personally like the way a little bit of noise looks as long as it's subtle, so I actually prefer to turn the denoiser off and let ProWalker run a little bit longer. In the finished image, for example, I, even though you can't tell in the zoomed out version of this image, I actually did have the denoiser turned off. So if we zoom way in here, you can see there's still some noise in this render, but when we view it in a web browser, for example, you don't really notice the noise. It gives it a little bit of texture, um, and I sort of just like the way it feels in the image. 
and you only really notice it if you get really close. Okay, but if you are in a hurry and you just need an image fast, turn the denoiser on and you'll generally get a finished image a little bit quicker. All right, so ultimately the final quality of your render depends on the number of samples that you allow ProWalker to calculate. And this is called the termination criteria. We control it from the render settings dialog under the gear icon. Now, so far I've been stopping the render after 15 samples, but as you can see, we have three different options here under termination. If samples is selected as it is right now, it means we're telling ProWalker the exact number of samples it should complete before it stops rendering the image. So if I set this number to 15, ProWalker calculates 15 samples and then stops, which is what has happened here in the preview window. And it's easy to see how unfinished this render looks. So if I set this number to 1000 samples and click OK, then ProWalker is going to keep going until the sample count reaches 1000, which means the image quality is going to be that much better. Right, so there aren't really any hard and fast rules about how many samples an image will need. Exteriors tend to require fewer samples than interiors, and interiors with artificial lights tend to require more samples than interiors that are only lit by the sun. So in this image we have both natural light and artificial light, so we're going to need a relatively high sample count, and I estimate the number of samples that I'll end up using for this is somewhere between 1,000 and maybe 4,000 samples. It's hard to guess, um, but just based on previous projects, that's what I would say. I also tend to overshoot the sample counts a little bit. I set up my renders to run overnight for the most part, and because I'm not gonna need the computer until morning, I'm, I'm fine with letting it run longer than it needs to. So if I set this to something like 4,000 samples, and it looks good after 2,000, that's fine. Um, ProWalker rendered for a little bit longer than it needed to, but it, it doesn't really affect my workflow. Okay, the other termination criteria option is time, and this means we're setting a time limit for the render, measured in seconds. So if I type in 30 here and click OK, it means ProWalker is going to render that image for 30 seconds and then stop. If I come back into the dialog box and type in 3600 seconds, it means ProWalker is going to run for a full hour on that image and calculate as many samples as possible in that amount of time. So using a time-based termination criteria is really useful when you're rendering animation, especially because you can set a time limit per frame and it, it lets you control the amount of time that you let ProWalker render really complex projects. Or if you've got a tight deadline, if you know you need an image in you know an hour from now, like I said, you can type in 3600 seconds, click OK, and that way you know you're gonna have something to show in exactly an hour. The automatic slider, I admit I don't really use, but it just means you're letting ProWalker determine when it should stop on its own. Moving the slider to the left means you're gonna get an image faster. Moving it to the right towards fine means ProWalker's gonna calculate more samples. You're increasing the quality and increasing the render time. I haven't really used it enough to give you any more detail than that. I just know that fast means faster and lower quality, fine means higher quality. If you have it all the way to the right, technically ProWalker should run until the image converges upon a really high quality, clean result. The, the, the main reason I don't use it as much is just because of the unpredictability. I'm not sure how long it's gonna take if I move this slider all the way to the right, so I prefer to either set a time limit or set a discrete sample count so I know what I'm getting. All right, so that's how we control the render quality of our output. Now, one thing I wanna be clear about is that the image you see here in the viewport is just a preview image. The viewport render will never be saved, so keep that in mind uh, and don't waste any time like letting this run up to a thousand samples or something like that, thinking you're gonna be able to save the image when it's finished. Um, again, this is just a preview image, it's, there to assist you as you set up your settings, configure your lighting, camera angles, stuff like that, but what you see in the viewport is never gonna be saved. In order to save a still image, you have to actually use the export image function, uh, but we'll cover that a little bit later. All right, the next thing I wanna mention is render modes. So up here in the upper left corner of the interface, we've got these four icons, nav, quick, ID, and PR, and these are the four different render modes that ProWalker GPU includes. Now, as you can see, we've currently got PR selected, and that stands for Photo Real Mode. Photo Real Mode is an unbiased path tracing algorithm, and it's the highest quality render output that ProWalker can provide. That also means it's the slowest and requires the highest number of samples. However, for rendering still images, 
it tends to be worth the result. And PR mode is what I ended up using for the finished image. Okay, so ID mode is a step down in quality, but it also happens to be quite a bit faster than PR mode. So I've switched into ID mode and you'll notice a couple things right off the bat. First is that the image is way darker. Um, and that's a product of two things. The first is that lighting is just overall darker when you're using ID mode. I'm not exactly sure why, but it means we have to compensate in the lighting dialog, which I'll show you in a second. The second thing is we're not getting any light from any of these light fixtures, and that's because ID mode doesn't support light emitting materials. So that is a pretty big trade-off, but that doesn't mean we can't get really good images out of ID mode, and the, the main benefit here is that we get them very, very quickly compared to photo real mode. So if I open up the lighting interface here and just bump up the value of the physical sky, you can see we, we immediately get a ton more light in the room. And so all that slider does is increases the brightness of the sun in the sky. And so if I close that and come back here into the settings dialog, this was only a five second render, but if I set this to something like 30 seconds and click okay, you're gonna see when we have ID mode activated, we actually get an image really, really quickly. For a lot of models, you can use ID mode for a finished render and, and end up really happy with it. I've seen excellent results with ID mode. Uh, so we'll see how many samples this actually gets through in 30 seconds. But that's another thing about ID mode is that you definitely don't need nearly as many samples. You know, in PR mode with an interior, you often need 2,000 or more samples. With ID mode, chances are something in the hundreds will give you a pretty clean result. So you can see in, in only 30 seconds, we've gotten something that looks really pretty nice, considering how little time we actually spent making it. And if we went up into render settings and turn this to something like five minutes, instead of 45 seconds, the image would look even nicer. Okay, so ID mode is a great trade-off uh, for rendering still images when you you need high quality, but you need it considerably faster than you could do with PR mode. All right, the next step down is quick mode. And even though this is faster even than ID mode, you can definitely see there's a noticeable drop in quality. Uh, this image is a lot flatter. The contrast isn't as good. The light distribution isn't as realistic. This is sort of where I draw the line. I would never personally use quick mode to render still images, however, it can be pretty useful for animations. If you need a thousand frames of an animation or something like that, you know, an animation that's gonna be a few minutes long, you can easily come in here and set your termination criteria at like 15 or 20 seconds per frame and end up with an animated video within a few hours. Whereas in ID mode or PR mode, you'd be looking at, you know, something like maybe two minutes per frame or even in PR mode, 20, to 30 minutes per frame, which is almost unthinkable on most hardware. So quick mode, not super useful for still images, but it is useful for animation. One unique thing about quick mode is that it uses screen space ambient occlusion. So right here in the lighting and tone map settings, when you have quick mode activated, this ambient slider becomes relevant. This doesn't make a difference in any of the other render modes, but when you're using this render mode, you can change the amount of ambient light by moving this slider. It starts at a default of 1000, I believe, but cutting it down to something like 500 sort of deepens the shadows and increases the contrast. Let me reset that and quickly talk about nav mode. So nav mode is the fastest render mode, but it's not really meant to be used for rendering. What it is, is a, a lightweight fallback that allows you to smoothly navigate around the viewport. So I'm in quick mode right now, but if I make any camera movement, ProWalker is going to temporarily drop into nav mode while I'm moving the camera. And this entire viewport is interactive. So we have the exact same movement controls that we have access to in SketchUp while we're, while we're working inside ProWalker. So if I hold shift and the middle mouse button, I pan the camera and you can see it sort of goes into this really flat looking render mode and that's nav mode. Um, I can hold the middle mouse button to orbit around the cursor. I can hold the left mouse button and drag and that tracks the camera at a constant height. I can turn left or right while 
you know, it's it's like a dolly or a tracking motion. Oops, let me go back into the space. Holding the right mountain button tilts the camera so we can look wherever we want. Um, and then we also have access to WASD controls, which is sort of like a game engine. If you hold W, you'll go forward, S to go backwards, D to go right, A to go left. And then if we want to reset the camera view so that it matches what we have in the SketchUp viewport, I just click this sync camera icon and we're right back to where we started. So nav mode basically makes it easier for your computer to handle this real-time motion. It's not so bad when you're in quick mode, but when you're in PR mode and you try and make a camera movement, it can get really, really laggy unless you have a super high-end GPU. So nav mode is just a utility mode for navigation purposes. All right, I think I've said everything that needs to be said about render mode. So as you can see, I've switched back to photo real mode with the LEM lights turned on. And let's start talking about how we can take this thing to a finished image. So the one dialog box that I haven't really shown you yet is the background settings dialog. And this determines what sort of sun and sky simulation we're gonna be using. So there's two options. You can use HDR image-based lighting, which is what I ended up using for this image or you can use the physical sky simulation. And this is similar to Podium's physical skies in the sense that it uses the SketchUp sun and shadows to determine the shadow position. So simulation is a great option if you want to precisely set the position of the shadows using the date and time settings in SketchUp. And if you want pretty clearly defined light and shadow spots in your, in your image. So if I turn on the denoiser here, you can clearly see exactly where the sunlight is falling in this image. Um, and it's got sort of these pretty sharply defined edges. Now, looking at the reference image, the, the lighting result over here isn't really that sharply defined. There is some intensity to the lighting, but it's a little bit more diffuse. So this is the ref, and if we look at the rendered image, I'd say we've matched it pretty closely. You know, the position isn't exactly the same, but we have the same sort of diffuse, bright result without having clearly defined edges. And in ProWalker, the best way to do this is to use HDR image-based lighting instead of the sky simulation. So going back to HDRI here, you can see those really hard sun and shadow spots have disappeared. And we have an overall lighting result that matches the reference image a lot more closely with this diffuse sort of brightness right here by the, the, by the shower and bath area. Okay, so we have an offset control and that lets us rotate the background image around a center point. So with HDRI rendering, the, the image itself contains all the lighting information. So let me go into SketchUp real quick and open the SU Podium HDRI slash IBL dialog. This is afternoon one. So this is the background that I'm using for that render in Pro Walker. And as I rotate it, you can see it's very, very obvious where the sun is in this image. It's this big, bright white spot. I can bring the exposure down a little bit so we can see it more clearly. So as I rotate this background around the center point, we can position the sun and shadows that way. So basically, I don't want the sun directly in front of the camera because it would be just blocked by this, this rear wall. There's no light coming in from directly in front of the camera. The window is right here, so I need the sun to be off to the left. And now the rotation offset in Pro Walker and SU Podium isn't the same. It's actually off by about 90 degrees. So if we go back into Pro Walker, the way I did that was I experimented with this value and finally decided that 77 was what I liked. I thought 77 was a good sun position to get some light falling here onto the bath, into the shower area, uh, and just overall matched the, the final look of the reference image. So if I ever did want to change the position of the sun, all I would have to do is change this value. For example, if I set this to 42 and hit enter, a few seconds later, the shadow position is going to update. You can see we've got this light spot falling onto the, the near wall here, right above the bath. This actually looks pretty good. Um, but I'll stick with 77 since that was what I used for the original render and we'll continue on. 
Okay, so under the drop down menu, there's five options that install by default afternoon one, afternoon two, morning, sunset one, sunset two. And this just means you're selecting a different HDR background image. So if I go to sunset two, for example, the overall look and feel of this is going to be very different. I've got much more red and orange in the image. The view outside the window is different. If I rotate this around, we'll even see a different view, right? So playing with different HDR background images is a really good way to mess around with different lighting results. And you can add images to this folder. The way you do that is to open up the ProWalker GPU install directory and then just save the HDR background images directly into the backgrounds folder. The exact path for this on Windows is C, users, username, app data, roaming. So in order to find app data, you do need to go into the view tab and make sure hidden items is checked. I'll click through the whole thing. So from app data, you go to roaming, scroll down to SketchUp, choose your version. I'm in 2020. SketchUp, plugins, find ProWalker. And then it's under PW app, backgrounds, and the background images go right here. So if I go over to my web browser, I have hdrihaven.com opened up, and this is a really good source for free HDRI images. Let's just choose something from skies. Um, we'll say, yeah, rural land, or let's, let's do this one because it's a nice starry evening. Click this. Um, just so it downloads quickly, I'm going to get a small image, but if you have time, I would go for the 16K resolution. I go to save file, SketchUp 2020. Plugins, ProWalker, PW app, backgrounds, save. And now if I reopen, you have to shut down and reopen ProWalker before that'll show up. But next time I open the interface, okay, back into backgrounds, and you can see that Kloppenheim 02 is right in there. All right, so that brings us to the very last stage. I'm gonna go back to afternoon one because that's what I intend to use for the rendered image and set this back to 77. So we're back to the original background selection and orientation. And the last thing I wanna show you is how to rebalance the different light sources um, using the ProWalker lighting interface. So let me close the background settings and open the lighting. And this has come up a few times throughout the course of the video, but I haven't really talked about it much. Now, ProWalker gives us the ability to change the light levels of all the different light sources in this interactive lighting interface. So the physical slider corresponds to the brightness of the background, which in this case is the HDRI background image. If you're using simulation, that would be the sun in the sky. The ambient slider only pertains to quick mode, and I mentioned that in a previous video. Artificial lights only controls omni lights and spotlights from the podium light system. We don't have any of those in our image, so if I move this up and down, it doesn't actually affect anything. The light levels don't change. Whereas if I brought this all the way down to 0 0.1, it's going to get a little bit darker. Or up to 10, it's going to get super, super bright. So let me click reset all to put those all back to one. Now, what I'm noticing about this image right now is that the lighting is very, very washed out. We have way too much light coming from these LEM lights. So what I wanna do is bring those light sources down, way down. Um, it's actually sort of a flaw in ProWalker GPU that the, the LEM materials are just a little bit too strong by default, in my opinion. Um, these, the light powers on these LEMs would work pretty well for rendering with SU Podium, but they're just too bright in ProWalker GPU. So what I do is bring this way down to either 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. And that's already much better. We're going to increase the brightness of the physical sky, um, but I just wanted to show you what that looked like and how much light was actually coming from those LEMs. One good way to check exactly how much light you have from your LEMs is to put a pure black background in the HDRI dropdown. So I have a, back, a black background in there, and if I activate that, it means I'm turning off the sun and sky completely, right? So now there's no light coming in through that window. There's no light from the sun and the sky at all. 
And what we see in the image now is the light from the LEM materials. So this might, this might actually be a little bit too low, but I want to show you what it looks like if I have this back at one. Okay, it's just far too much light. Uh, looking at the reference image, I want the primary light source to be the window, not these lights. These lights are a really nice accent and they provide interest in the image and a little bit of um, tonal variation. You know, you've got this warm light coming from these light fixtures, but overall I want this scene to be lit by natural light coming in from that window. So what we need to do is bring these LEM materials down to, I think I'm gonna go with 0.2 because I think 0.1 was just a little bit too dim. And I think that's a pretty good level. Now, if we go back into the HDR drop down, reactivate afternoon one with that 77, we're gonna get a ton more light coming in through that window, but it's still too dark. The exposure in this image is quite a bit higher. I do like to underexpose my images just a little bit in the render engine and then bring the brightness up a bit in post-processing. That's just how I choose to work, um, but this is still too dim. So what I'm gonna do is come into the lighting dialog and I'm actually gonna bump the physical sky all the way up to, let's try about four and see how that looks. So I type in four, hit enter. And yeah, I think that looks quite a bit better. Um, the brightness is a lot closer to what we see in the reference image. And like I mentioned before, I can do some post-processing brightness and contrast and color corrections to get it exactly where I want it. So I can't remember if, if that's the exact value that I used in the render, um, but I know it was somewhere between like three and four. And if that was still too dark for your taste, you could bump it up even further to something like 5.5. Um, but I don't think I would go too much brighter than this. So looking at the reference image, we're getting pretty close to the overall exposure. And like I said, I can always make final adjustments in post-processing, but I really don't want to overexpose the image in the render engine. Um, I want to make sure I have a nice balance of light and dark because I don't want to lose any detail from the shadow areas. So for my taste, I thought something around 4.2 looked like a pretty good balance between light and dark. So that's what I'm gonna go with for the render. Okay, there's one more little thing I wanna show you. The under the tone map section, we have a brightness and gamma slider. Brightness is really straightforward. You're just adding or removing brightness uniformly from the entire image. Unlike the physical slider, which only controls the light coming in from the sun and sky or from the background image, the brightness slider affects the entire image evenly. Um, the gamma slider, Unfortunately, I can't really give you a really eloquent, concise definition of what gamma means in mathematical terms, but I do know if you lower this, you're pretty much going to increase the contrast in the image. So let me type in 1.7 here and you'll see the dark areas kind of get darker and the bright areas almost stay the same. So you could compensate a little bit, maybe bring this to like 1.2. Could even bring this down a little bit further to 1.5. Um, and so that's just one alternate way to manipulate sort of the overall light distribution in the image. I'm gonna reset these back to, let's say 1.9 and I'll put this back at 1.0. And let's make one more fine little adjustment here. Put the physical at 4.5. All right, and that's that's how we fine tune the light in our ProWalker render. So now I think I've got this right where I want it to be and I'm ready to export a finished render. So lighting and tone mapping are set up. Let me close this dialog. We've got our background all taken care of. We don't need to make any changes there. PR mode is selected. I mentioned before that I, I don't love to use the denoiser for finished images if I have plenty of time, and in this case I do. So I'm actually gonna turn it off and we're gonna go without the denoiser. But you can do whatever you want. If you're pressed for time, keep it on and use maybe a lower sample count. Um, so the last thing to do is pick our termination criteria. I did a couple tests and this was needing quite a few samples. So in my finished render, I actually went with a really high resolution and I bumped the samples all the way up to 4,000. I'm not exactly sure how long my finished render took because I did it overnight, 
Um, I didn't, I didn't check the start time and end time, um, but I'll just click OK. And everything's set up. So now I can use the capture an image icon to start the final render. OK, so this little dialog box opens up. At the top, we choose the output format. I always use PNG because it's uncompressed. It holds a little bit more image data than JPEG does and doesn't degrade the image quality at all. So I select PNG. Under window size, we have two options. We can either render at the window size, which is exactly the same resolution as the ProWalker preview viewport, uh, or we can, we can enter a custom value. Now, what I tend to do is find out my window size and then double it, or at least scale it up by a significant amount. So I happen to know that my ProWalker viewport is 1506 by 904, but that's sort of low for a finished render. So what I would either do is double that, which would be 3012 by 1808, or if I don't think I have time for something quite this large, I would just scale it by you know, a discrete percentage. So you can do that in a lot of ways. You can do it with a calculator by hand, or I tend to just use Photoshop and use their image resize options. So the original size is 1506. Let's see, I just, I just wanted to bump up the output resolution to like 2500 and that automatically scales the other value. So that gives me a resolution of 2500 by 1501, and then I can just flip back to ProWalker and type that in. 2500 by 1501. All right, so once I click OK, it's gonna start rendering. So I'm rendering a, an image with a resolution of 2500 by 501. It's gonna be exactly what we see in the viewport, but a little bit larger, and we're gonna get 4,000 samples. So it, by the time that's finished, the render should be pretty clean. You can see right now the preview is at 101 samples. So we're adding, and, and the image is already starting to look pretty good, despite how noisy it is. So by the time it hits 4,000 samples, almost all that noise should be gone. We should have a really, really nice render. So I click OK and let ProWalker run. Render example, save. And there you go, you get a progress bar and then you just have to wait. All right, for the very last section, I'm just gonna show you some basic post-processing skills and sort of how I put the finishing touches on a render. So this was the finished render from ProWalker GPU. And as you can see, uh, it looks pretty good. It's nice and clean. All the basics of the lighting are there. If we compare it to the reference image, it looks pretty close. It just sort of lacks the energy and punchiness that this image has. So this needs a little bit more contrast. We're gonna increase the brightness in certain parts of the image and just make it look a little bit more like this. Okay, let's flip back to the render and spend a few minutes making it look a little bit nicer. So I think the first thing that I noticed right off the bat was the sort of intensity of the light over here kind of falls short in the render. So I'm gonna use a levels adjustment to bring those values up under layer, new adjustment layer, levels, okay. And instead of manipulating this curve on my own, the first thing I'm gonna try is using the eyedropper tool here at the bottom to set my white point in the image. So I click here and I wanna zoom in and choose a region of the image that I think should be pure white. Um, the most obvious is the window, but I think the window is already close enough to white that if I choose that, it's not gonna have a real drastic effect. For example, if I set the white point and click here, nothing changed. However, if I click set white point and come down here and grab a spot that's actually just below white in the render, it's gonna bring up the values and the rest of the image. So I think this spot right here on the tub would be pretty good. When I click here, it's gonna take that spot and make it white and then adjust the rest of the image accordingly. So I click there. And like magic, that sort of brought up the luminance of the render right here. Um, but that increased the entire image's brightness and we want to preserve the contrast in the image. So I'm gonna take this left handle and bring it in just a little bit toward the center, not too far, because I think the I think the 
paint color starts to get too saturated if I bring it in too far. So I'm just going to bring it in right to the edge of where I see that histogram. And I'm going to grab the middle handle and slide it ever so slightly to the right. Okay. I'm going to close the levels adjustment layer and and I think the next thing we should try and do is correct the white balance because I think overall the tone of this image is a little bit too warm, a little bit too yellow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit control A to select all, shift control C to copy the merged image, control V to paste that on top. So now I've got this image with the levels adjustment as my top layer. I'm going to go under filter, camera raw filter. And right here under white balance, instead of as shot, I'm just going to try auto. And I'm pretty sure this is going to make the image, it's going to reduce the yellow cast and make it a lot more neutral, which is exactly what happened. Um, maybe it went a little bit too cold with it, but we could just, instead of going minus 19, say maybe minus 12. And I think that looks pretty good. Um, while we're in here, we can also take a look at the exposure and contrast. I think exposure is pretty good now since we did the levels adjustment. For contrast, um, I think we can safely bump this up to like 18. And that's where we're at currently. So this was the... Now, this was my finished image from before. So this was the first attempt I did at post-processing. Let's take a look at the reference image though. So now we're actually really close to the reference. Um, whereas my first attempt is probably a little bit more stylized. This second attempt is looking pretty close to what we had in the actual photograph. So I don't want to make this section drag on too long. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea how I approach post-processing. There are some differences. It's not perfect. Um, one thing about the photograph that I'm not seeing in the render is that we get some really nice additional light up here in the upper right section, and then also this reflection here on the vanities on those drawers. I'm not getting that nearly as much in the render. So that would be sort of a self critique. Uh, maybe we could have added a little bit more reflection to these cabinets. But yeah, I think that's pretty good. So I'm going to hit control A again, shift control C, control V. And then we'll see how just a quick sharpness adjustment looks. This image is already really sharp. But I could go up to Filter, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask. And then I think I would, because this image is so large, I'll probably set the radius to 1.5 pixels. And we can see, if I bump this like way up to 150, you'll see exactly what happens. Everything just gets sharper. Um, and we end up, it sort of emphasizes edges and highlights, but you wouldn't actually want to go more than probably about 25 and maybe not even that much but I'm gonna click OK and zoom out and see how it looks so yeah I think that's a good stopping point um, at least for the sake of this tutorial I'm not the greatest post-processing expert in the world there is a ton of material on YouTube that you can watch for these sort of techniques just search like post-processing for interior photography, and you'll find just a gold mine of videos on YouTube. But that's sort of how I post-process my images. So we went from, this is the original render, and this was the finish that we created just now. And I think it's definitely an improvement. We've got just a little bit more brightness and contrast, and the image feels a little bit more energetic. And I think that's a great stopping point. So for all of you guys that stuck with this thing the whole way, thank you so much. And I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, please let me know, either in the comments or through our support email or on the SU Podium forums. 
If you have never tried ProWalker before, I hope you give it a shot. It's really fun to use. Uh, and as you can see, it produces some really great images. This is one example, and this was the original. So I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, thank you so much.